I've been in this law firm, Bennett Jones, for 27 years. And the law firm here, so many of our clients are energy clients. So I've been involved helping them in their industry and in our industry for, you know, the better part of three decades. With respect to the Canadian Energy Executive Association, it used to be called the Oilmans, and we rebranded a number of years ago. That was easy because my good friend John Gorman of Halliburton was the chair of the 65th. We were doing some work for Halliburton and he kind of said, you should come to the Oilmans. And I said, well, how much does that cost? And he, he told me the number, which I really didn't have in my budget. So I said, well, I might think about doing this next year. He said, okay, well, I'll think about who does our legal services over the next year too. <laughs> so it was implied that it would be in strongly in my interest and the firm's interest to go. So I went and I fell in love with the organization. It's such a great organization. It, it, it advocates, it's great networking, and it raises money for community charities and stuff like that. So it was a perfect fit. So that's what got me excited. And, and since then, I mean, last year, my wife, Jen, and I had the good fortune to be uh, chairs. What a great experience that was. Probably the most fun thing I've done outside the practice of law. We have a common set of values in that organization, which I think in large part mirror the values in the energy industry. People are hardworking. They've got integrity. Their word means something. They're resilient. These folks just, they get knocked down, they get right back up. And they do it with a smile. Sometimes they're ticked off about the way, you know, our friends out east treat the industry. But that said, I mean, they pivot and they try to find other entrepreneurial ways around it. So now you've got this whole energy transformation. And that's just reflective again about the resilience of these people. And so you get all these folks in a room together. We all sort of have the same values that way. And then to boot, these are fun people. Like this is a work hard, play hard organization and everybody works really hard in their jobs, but this is a chance to blow off steam as well as well as advocating and pushing the needle. And so when we do get together, we have a lot of fun. Like-minded people having fun with the same values, it's kind of a no-brainer. I share the frustration in wondering why we have such a, a problem with the rest of the country, let alone the planet, and getting our message out. And I think it really has to do with a few things, if I was to guess. One is we're too polite. We just are Canadians, you know, we, we mind our business, we're diplomatic, we apologize for everything. In some cases, we ought to have apologized, but we apologize for everything. We're polite, we say please, and we don't want anyone to dislike us. To a fault, I think we have to be a little more assertive and we have to get back the narrative, which we've allowed others to define us instead of defining ourselves. As you mentioned, there's so many positives about hydrocarbons Oil and gas, I mean, apart from all the other energy sources, the diversity of energy that's out there, but 80% of our of the world's supply is oil and gas, and it's done such great things, people take it for granted. I mentioned to him earlier, I was reading, I'm reading currently Alex Epstein's book, Fossil Future, which makes the case for more hydrocarbons rather than less, and he's really nailed it. The younger generations, all they hear about are the negatives from Greta Thunberg and, and the politicians. All was negative, all was negative. We don't highlight well enough and brag about the positives and there's so many positives uh, in our lives and longevity per capita income like everything that has done so well because of hydrocarbons. I had the good fortune to travel across the country not as far north as I'd like but east to west Maritimes BC lived in BC for a while lived in Quebec for a while lived in Ontario recently in the last two years we've done some speaking engagements to universities in Eastern Canada, at Central Canada, most recently Queen's University in January of this year. We come in, we, the Canadian Energy Executive Association, we come in, we have a positive message, we try to shine a positive light on the benefits of hydrocarbons. Invariably, we've got this in the four schools we've been to, invariably the, the young, I say young kids, they're adults, these young adults come up after, are very thankful to have had the information, but they say, why don't, we didn't know this stuff. They don't teach it in the schools, most of them. Their professors and the faculty members themselves don't have the information. I think they're well-intentioned, but they just don't have the information. Yes, in part, it's a regional thing. Unless you experience the energy industry in your backyard, you may not think about it. You just flip, flick on the light switch, you hop in your gas-driven car on the asphalt road, and you go to the, you know, 
maybe you work in a hospital where it's all full of petrochemical equipment and you don't think about any of that stuff. It's in its 72nd year, although actually 73 years, but the COVID year was kind of a bit screwed up. So it's a 73 essentially year organization. It started out primarily as oil and gas, E&P, and producers. Lawyers were not invited in the day. Over the generations, it was really about a deal-making club, you know, and it was mostly men in those days. And it was where deals got made on the golf course and over bottles of wine and C-suite executives. Over the decades, it changed. It's in the last decade in particular, it's morphed into an organization that has a lot of deal making still, networking and C-suite, but it's there's a lot more advocacy. The organization just couldn't probably exist if all it was was a bunch of golfers and glass and bottles of wine. This organization realized we have to get out there and advocate. And in order for companies to send their executives to our golfing tournaments and our conferences, we have to have a message. We have to do more than just get together and drink wine. We have to actually advocate for the industry. So we started to do that. We've gone, uh, last year we started with a national engagement strategy, going to universities. That's continued this year under Brent Nelson Quinton, who are our chairs this year. We've started an education fund that will award indigenous scholarships and young professionals in energy scholarships. And that's uh, creation of Brian Ham and, and Deanna Ham, who are the vice chairs this year. And then we, our third pillar, so the first is networking, still deals to be done. Second is advocacy and the third is community engagement and fundraising. And so last year we gave over 120 grand to um, the Alzheimer's Society in Calgary, which affects so many of us, as well as the Stardale and Indigenous Women's Group. So advocacy, networking and community involvement, those are the three tenants. But it is, I say to you, it's C-suite. It still really is C-suite. It's, it's CEOs, CFOs, vice presidents, partners, owners, First Nation leaders, chiefs, but we've also spread our, our wings a little bit. We have last week, for instance, the Beyond Boomers Conference, where we invite a number of young professionals. So they're not quite C-suite yet, but they're the future of the energy industry. And, you know, at a subsidized price and with sponsorship, we have those young professionals in a room with a lot of the C-suite and, and get them fired up about the energy industry. Here I am saying you can, you know, make a difference in the world, you can earn a great income. Well, that was the theme last week. And so I, I believe it. Maybe it's, maybe I'm just drinking the juice, but I really believe that this is the place to be. Our organization is is a window into that industry. It's, it's only one window. There's others out there, but I would invite anybody to look us up for membership and to consider joining. You've been to our events. Awesome. And it's a place where as a young person with in intelligence and hard work and drive, you can not only make great living, but you can make the world a better place. This strive to decarbonize, for instance, to uh, diversify the energy sources, but to also uh, increase our standard of living, the length of our lives, the health we have, that can all be done through energy, energy technology. So. For young people particularly, this is like Kevin Krauser said it, this is the new internet. You can make a great living and you can change the planet. What else do you want? Back in the day, a guy I quite liked as a politician, Brian Mulroney, tried with the Meech Lake Accord, the Charlottetown Accord to, to rejig the constitution so we had a triple E Senate, for instance. And we had more regional voice than we currently do, where you're right, the, the polls haven't even closed in Alberta and BC, and we already know who Prime Minister is in most elections. I applaud politicians and premiers like Daniel Smith, Scott Moe, who are trying within the framework of the Constitution and within a United Canada, trying to get us some elbow room and demanding that we be treated fairly and that, you know, this is a federalism. It's not a superior form of government where the federals are bigger and better than the provinces. In our feder confederation, they're equal parties in the constitution, but they're not treated that way sometimes. And so I do applaud the Western governments trying to push back and, and trying to you know say to the Fed, stay in your lane. I think that should continue. If it was up to me, I'd try to make a case for a revisit to the constitution. And it, you know, for a period of time, you mentioned the C word, constitution. You could never get elected, nobody was interested. I think there might be a rightness for it again. And who knows what Pierre Poliev, if he got into government, what, what he might like to do, but that would be the ultimate reset is the constitution. Failing which we've got to operate within what we have. And I think the Western premiers are trying to do that as best they can. I want to go back to one thing, education. Information and education. Our organization 
is trying to do it small steps, right? But the energy industry as a whole has to educate our Central Canadian friends and our Eastern Canadian friends. Your magazine, your efforts and what you do is part of the equation. What we're doing is part of the equation. Synergy amongst all that stuff will help us get there. And I, I'm seeing good things happening. It's terrible what's happened in the Ukraine. The silver lining in that is it's, ref it's shone the light on energy security and reliability and all the crap that's going on in Europe. And so it's given us an opportunity to get people's attention. And I think we're starting to move the needle. When Prime Minister Trudeau says there's no business case, really, there's no business case? Now, I'm mindful that he was not educated as a commerce student or did his MBA or ever worked in the energy industry, but presumably he's got some advisors. And I don't know where he got the information there wasn't a business case when two of your allies come cap in hand. I can only chalk it up to blinders and a view of hydrocarbons and energy that is basically keep it in the ground. I suspect the winds are changing, blowing a different way. And I hope in the next three to five years, we get asked again, those questions, can, can we please supply? But you got to build infrastructure in order to supply. This particular Liberal government has done a very good job of preventing anything from being built. Ideologically, they're achieving their result. They're keeping it in the ground. It's frustrating as hell. I do think with education and information and a little less politeness on our part and bragging about what we do, we can start to move the needle a bit. I'm not as pessimistic maybe in the future as, as perhaps you are at the moment. A lot of things have to change for that, for us to get there. I think it's partly the model of the corporation where the shareholders reward CEOs and the, the board of directors reward management for quarterly results. And it's so focused on that, that executives that take the longer view, they're always aware of investor meetings, shareholder meetings, they want to stay in management. And to do that, it's it's a short term view. A longer term view would be more ideal. I pay voters turf out governments after eight years. I mean, maybe that'll happen with Trudeau. So if Paul gives the next one and it takes eight years to get infrastructure built, maybe his term will be up by the time it's built. And then, and then we'll cycle back to the liberals again. Golf, golf. I love golf. I love golfing, and I'd say golf. At the risk of, of sounding very single-minded on golf, I've always loved the game. I used to work at golf courses when I was growing up. My wife loves to golf, so the two of us enjoy our family time together. My kids are golfing. I'll say golf exponentially. I'm a big Flames fan. I was never a very good player. I was a good beer league guy, but I've always loved the game of hockey. I think it's a great team game. My Flames have only ever won one cup, damn it. They're not going to probably win one this year, but I, I'm a real flame. We've had the good fortune to be able to travel and with remote work, you know, during COVID, we were able to do some of that. We've enjoyed traveling, uh, my wife and I. I enjoy reading. That sounds pretty boring. Over the last five to seven years since I've been involved in this organization, I've really started to try to educate myself on it. And most of that's just been through reading. And then I'm going to throw this at you. Zip lining. So zip line, my kids, you know, when they're teenagers, that was one of the great things we had a lot of fun. I'm, I'm kind of a thrill seeker. I love amusement rides. You know, you hit turbulence in an aircraft. Everyone gets freaked out when you drop and your, your stomach. I love, do you know that most people in Calgary are not Calgarians by birth? It's a very diverse city. It's become much more diverse culturally as well. The old Calgary, and, and I was born, I'm born and raised in Calgary, so I'm a native Calgarian, I, I, I can speak intelligently on this. I think the historic Calgary was pretty Caucasian, pretty conservative, pretty heterosexual, very traditional, probably was like the Texas of Canada. I think that we've become a lot more nuanced, we're a lot more diverse ethnicity as well as sexuality as well as political can you believe the ndp formed our government at one stage i think people who don't live in calgary i don't think they realize how it changed mostly for the better i'd say there are still some things that as an energy guy i'd like to have seen done differently but our mayors both cities have been quite progressive over the last 15 20 years and uh, i think that's reflected culturally we've got a lot more going on in the city than you know a torontonian might think we do i'm pretty proud to be a calgary and pr very proud to be an albertan also something in the water here because when people arrive in calgary they they volunteer they're entrepreneurs they're hard workers and they're resilient it's much like the industry they do it, and i think it rubs off on people first of all if you can 
come live, work, and play here because you'll see firsthand how great this place is and the people. But if you can't do that, at least support us. The values that we have, which so many other energy producing countries don't have, pat us on the back for that, support us for that. So don't decry and criticize our industry and we're trying to do great things on ESG and we're moving the needle on all sorts of indicators which show that we're better than the other sources of energy out there, the other countries. So support us and in turn, make the world a better place.